Welcome to the Unknown Webcast. I'm back from the 40th Annual Witnesses Now for Jesus Convention. Getting there and back was a little challenging because, as you know, I am so conservative, I can't turn left even when I'm driving. This, that means this is not a safe space for those who may be easily offended by having their ideas challenged or by our satire. This is broadcast number 118, and this week we have Joe Whitchurch from Rosho Christie, and the topic is tolerating intolerance. Uh, my name is Don Vino. I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in Wonder Lake, Illinois, which produces the Unknown Webcast. And our senior researcher is Ron Hensel, who will introduce the sponsors of today's webcast. And here is Ronnie. Well, welcome. Greetings from sunny Florida, where the palm tree came out, saw its shadow. Now we have 12 more months of summer. Our sponsors today uh, this, for this webcast include the brand new game from the Real McCoy Gaming Company, Where's the Outrage? It makes helps you to be part of something bigger than yourself while still being the center of attention. And... World's End Theology Outlet, your one-stop resource for half-baked heresies, dubious doctrines, and other ideas whose time has gone. World's End Theology Outlet. And if you enjoy our webcast, or if you, if it annoys you and you just want to inflict it upon other people, please go to our website, midwestoutreach.org, to ensure continued access. Click the yellow donate button and contribute as you feel led. And don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. And back to the studios. Okay, and we're getting an echo somewhere. I'm not sure from who. You know what? It's probably from me. Here, I forgot to plug my headphones in. Oh, well, that might have something to do with it. It's Was that better now? Yes, definitely better, yes. Okay. I, get, I didn't know that the sound wasn't coming from my headphones. I don't know how I did. I mean, I'm getting old, guys. I'm... <clears throat> I know you well, guys. You're, you're, you, you may be the youngest one in this uh, team here today. I mean, I, I'm officially old now, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got the official one. And so, and so we have we have Joe, who I, I I never ask him how old he is, but I'm I'm guessing he's close to being officially old as well. Sixty-four. Si oh, Will you yeah, still no, need me? Normal. Will you still feed me? Sixty-four. <laughs> That's right. Oh. All right, so Joe Whitchurch is with Rochelle Christie. We've had you on before, and, and you always know you've been had when we're done, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> why don't you explain a little bit about Rochelle Christie so people have a clue? It's not a Roman Catholic organization, right? It's not a what organization? Roman Catholic. Uh, no, RC could be, right? Or a royal crown. Cult. Everybody knows Ro Roman Catholics don't speak Latin anymore. Come on. Uh, <laughs> well, Mel Gibson is a Roman Catholic church, does. I mean, well, this one okay, is Latin. Some of them do. Our name is Latin. It's Ratio Christi. Christi. Or Ratio Christi. Or Ratio. It's, yeah, on. it means the reason of Christ. You know, a lot of people talk about their faith in Christ in purely psychological terms. It gives them peace. It gives them assurance. It gives them joy. It gives them happiness. And a lot of times people, even when sharing their faith, we tell them, oh, just share your testimony because nobody can refute your testimony. But what we're trying to emphasize is loving God with all of our mind. And Jesus is the reason or our having reason. So Rasio Christie is the name of the organization. And I know you've had guests on from Rasio Christie before. I believe I've seen uh, Mark Tabladillo, who I Absolutely. supervise. He's our regional director in Atlanta and Florida. I'm currently serving in the role of vice president of campus operations in the United States. And so what are your favorite vices, I guess would be my question. My favorite vices, oh, that's good. <laughs> I'm kind of fond of Pence. He's from here in Indiana. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's good. I mean, it, you know, and it's, it, it's, it is important because uh, the greatest commandment includes the heart and the soul and the mind. Mm. But somehow that aspect has been largely neglected over the years. I, I remember years ago, uh, I was at the um, uh, Cornerstone Festival 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 with uh uh my friend uh J dr james sire uh and he was bemoaning the lack of uh of uh, intellectual pursuits within a christian faith 
Uh, and, and that struck me. That struck a chord with me. I hadn't really thought about it prior to that book. He loved uh, um, engaging the mind in the life of faith, and he was very keen on that. So, Mark Knowles had that as a major theme, George Marsden. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Uh, okay, when you say it's a challenge, what does that mean? And now that means even in the university. And there, there's this, have you ever worked with a high school group? You know, even as early as junior high, it becomes very uncool to be smart uh, at a pretty <laughs> early age. And so people, they may know the answer, but they don't want to raise the hand because they're going to get ridicule for uh, being smart. Anyway, there's there's such a thing as being a smart aleck and a know-it-all. I'm not talking about that. But there is there is something to the pursuit of truth that should be valued. I think it was Socrates that said, the unexamined life is not worth living, and we need to be um, inquiring. And even in the university today, a lot of things are really related to getting a job, getting skills, uh, passing tests, learning to memorize things quickly and regurgitating them, and then passing the course and then getting on with life and forgetting everything that you learn. So the definition of a lecture in the university is where the professor's notes go from his paper to the paper of the student without passing through the mind of either one. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's challenging. Well, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned uh, at some point it gets, it becomes, uh, what do you call it, not fashionable or not uh, popular to be smart. You were saying, what did you identify that as, middle school age or what? Yeah, I think so. Well, I taught middle school for eight years, and um, you're at fault. I think <laughs> most of my fault. Just, just kidding. I, actually, I think it was happening before I was teaching it, so I'm not sure about maybe, that. Maybe yeah. earlier. I think it has some. You know, it's it's not a hundred percent true. I think the kids. I think it depends on how the kids are guided and whether they respect the people who are trying to guide them at that point. True. And another part of it. Another dimension of it is is that in the middle school age, that's when the kids are starting to, you know, shoot up in height and uh, it's hormones. easier. Height it's and hormones. Easier. hormones. It, it, yeah, and, and kids want to do what's easiest. It's easier to display physical superiority if that's your bag, than it is mental superiority for just about anybody, really. Sports but, and it, celebrities it, feed right into that. Not exactly the yeah. brightest bulbs usually. Being competitive intellectually takes a different kind of work and some yeah. often harder work than going out and having fun and doing physical things. So I think that's part of it. So. Yeah, let me ask you a question. We're talking about the, the life of the mind here as we kind of lead into this question of uh, uh, our topic of tolerating intolerance. I, I wonder, is it easier to tolerate someone whom you disagree with if you are intellectually engaged than if you are primarily emotionally engaged? I think the answer to that one's yes. And a good case for that is our, our recent uh, confirmation hearings in the United States Senate on uh, Judge Kavanaugh. Awful lot of emotion, awful lot of fear, awful lot of uh, grandstanding, and not a lot of looking just at the facts of the case and what the witnesses said and didn't say and who they collaborated and who they didn't. Um, yeah, a lot easier to tolerate if you're saying, well, how did you come to that conclusion? As uh, Greg Kokel uh, teaches us to do in his book. And, and uh, where, where are the facts behind that? And how do you support that? Uh, and we're listening to understand, but we're also pointing out holes in, in the testimony and, and understanding. But if people are just shouting, you're a racist, you're a homophobe, you're going to kill women, uh, <laughs> doesn't make it right doesn't make for a context where you want to walk in the middle of that circle and have you know, a meaningful conversation. You're going to get punched in the mouth. <laughs> there, there, there's really nothing new under the sun. I was, um, I, I saw a, a, a picture of women's suffragettes, suffragists, you know, the uh, pushing for the right of women to vote. Uh, a, a group of them back in, I, I guess it would have been in the 19 teens because Woodrow Wilson was president and the, the amendment uh, to uh, to allow women to vote hadn't been passed yet, and um, the signs they were there were two two women carrying signs that were identical, one on each end of the picture, and the sign said Wim Wilson doesn't care about women. 
Okay, so in other, in other words, even back then, they were so polarizing the issue that if you disagree with me on this particular point, whether or not women should be allowed to vote, if you if you dis if you say they shouldn't be allowed, that means you don't care about women. You don't care anything about women. Uh, they they can't. They weren't even able to state it in moderate terms. Uh, personalized it a hundred years ago, right? And they and they took it. They it wasn't even a reasonable statement to make. I mean, did nope. is it reasonable to conclude that Wilson did not care about women just because he might have disagreed? And I don't even know what his position was on it. Maybe they well, were mad at him because he wasn't going fast enough or something. I don't well, know. a Dinesh D'Souza video uh, portrays Woodrow Wilson as quite the racist. So if, if oh, yeah, he was yeah. also a misogynist, yeah, he may well, well have been. I don't know. You, right? <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? I'm sorry. Wouldn't surprise you no, if, he, if he was also a misogynist, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I remember uh, when Bush W. was running the first time around. I was in the Lombard Post Office. I lived in Lombard. By the way, Joe, someone was asking uh, where in Indiana you're located. Oh, uh, Lafayette. It's just Lafayette. Uh, 100 miles, well, actually 60 miles north of Indianapolis and about the same south of South Chicago. So okay. right in between Chicago and Indianapolis. Okay, so answer that question. But I was in the Lombard Post Office uh, uh, waiting in line, and a woman just ahead of me uh, got up to the counter and she started pleading with the postal clerk there saying, you can't vote for Bush. He wants to kill women. And she was having this emotional meltdown. And I'm going, wait a minute. His mother's a woman. His wife is a woman. His, why would his he want to kill his women? Daughters are, his daughters his are, daughters daughters are women. Someday. <laughs> I, Barbara I, I was controlling the household. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was, uh, it was a shock to me to hear that. And then I realized, that it was a, a you know completely emotional outcry based on what information. It's not like the president has a, has the ability to just by the wave of a pen to change laws. They can't really do that. <laughs> uh, so it seems like people are not even really familiar with the whole way the political system works. And Since so you talked about our age, and I remember one on uh, I think it was W, uh, where they were showing a cartoon of his throwing old men and old women in wheelchairs down the <laughs> stairs. And I think this was because he wasn't supporting the kind of health care programs that they preferred. So, uh, and of course, the Republicans do the same thing. You know, uh, the Democrats are all communists and uh, whatnot. But uh, these days... Well, uh, and, and, and it isn't new. I mean, uh, one of the things is if, if you don't... For, for many people, history started about 18 minutes ago. Uh <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? They, yeah. they have no grasp of history. I, I look back, but Joy and I love history. And we look back and go, wait a minute. In the 1800s, they had knife fights in the Senate, on the Senate floor. Mm. They had fist fights. Well, and, uh, and, when you look at some of the political ads in that period, they were anything but nice. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to read about that in my new article uh, that's coming out for, on the blog this week. So. Okay. Is that oh, why you gosh, mentioned gonna... brass knuckles earlier? <laughs> no, I, I just came spontaneously out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So tolerating intolerance. For, we probably first need to define what tolerance is. That's that's really – I've been reading a book. I'll just uh, hold it up here for you. It's uh, written by Josh McDowell, of course. He's famous in apologetic circles and co-authored by his son, Sean McDowell. It's called The Beauty of Intolerance. And I'm discussing this with some university students from a uh, Latino a female, from Gary to uh, a grad student in Oklahoma, white male, and, uh, uh -oh. and white with male. others online. It's very do, good. They, do white males have valid opinions? I, I hope they do in Oklahoma, because there's a whole lot of them in <laughs> Oklahoma. <laughs> Uh, and it seems like there's quite a few on this show, too. <laughs> yeah. We've got a couple. we got a few but here, yeah. On pa page uh, 21, uh, they give a what they call a biblical understanding of the word tolerance, since you raised that point. Um, and uh, it, it says the biblical understanding of it is recognizing and respecting others when you don't share their values, beliefs, and practices. I would say it's not only a biblical understanding of tolerance, but it's also a traditional 
I think if you went to Webster's, you'd probably find a definition pretty similar to that. We tolerate people, we recognize and respect others when you don't share their values, beliefs, and practices. I mean, this is First Peter 3.15. It goes back to scripture, right? Give a reason, an answer, a reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and respect. There's, there's respect, there's tolerance, there's a conversation, but there's also reason, apologia, and evidence. But if you contrast that with the current generation definition of uh, tolerance, you'll see that uh, it's recognizing and respecting that every individual's values, truth claims, beliefs, and practices are equally valid. Oh, that's really? A little, that's a little bit That's a little bit different. So uh, that's tolerance, eh? Well, that's uh, I think the biblical and historical one is a lot more closer to the current uh, politically correct or everyone's everyone's power. opinions everyone's opinions are equally valid. Yeah, I know, isn't it? It's self-contradictory, right? Because I mean, if you're going to say that with Islam, Islam's Islam's values on homosexuality, you're going to say that's equal with Milo's. You're going to say that. Uh, <laughs> You know, this it's just incongruous. It's trying to say that uh, basically you have to not only hear people, not only respect people, not only listen carefully to people, but you have to agree with people and you have to celebrate uh, whatever it is they throw right. at you. And that's, right. that's let's, right. let's celebrate, except unless they're fascists, which yeah. uh, which well, is unless you're behaving don't like, like a fascist. But what if what? you're behaving like a fascist? <laughs> What, what it's, okay. Fascist, it's okay to be a fascist. It's like a, a Sacco and Vincenti. Remember that trial? Uh, uh, no, I don't. The, they were. It was during the uh, uh, during the anarchist, um, you know, Revolution? scare. It was turn of the century, turn of the twentieth century. Uh, two Italian guys. There, something something blew up somewhere, and uh, they needed to, to pin it on somebody. Oh, so they grabbed these two Italian immigrants who could barely speak English, Sacco and Vincenti, and they charged them with the crime. I, I forget what what the crime was, to be honest. I just remember in school we had to read about them when I was a kid, and and they were being, you know, it was an, an example of discrimination against people who are different from you. And and uh, in the in the trial, they, you know. They ask one of the alleged witnesses, "Can you identify, you know, the the culprits?" And I, I, I for, she pointed them out or whatever. How do you know that's them? It was because they they were Italians. <laughs> well, how do you know? How do you know they were Italians? Be because they were they ran like Italians. <laughs> they ran. They like ran like Italians. Really? That got they got convicted. Reminds yeah. me of the Salem witch trials. There. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you so that that came to my mind when you said what if you sound like a fascist, but if you go to any of the standard reference works, you'll find that fascism is one of the hardest things to define in all of political science. Mm -hmm. What is fascism? What is it? <laughs> you know, I mean, okay, I'll let you talk now. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, I see this political theory as kind of like a circle, <laughs> and uh, the place of smaller government and maximum individual liberty is uh, maybe here on the sphere. And then when you come out here, you polarize left and right. And they both come around here and you've got uh, fascist Hitler on the so-called right, but he's a totalitarian. And you got uh, communist uh, Lenin, and he's a totalitarian as well. And he's on the left. And yeah. they're actually pretty darn close. But And all, also a lot of far away from uh, limited government and uh, individual liberties and freedom. Yeah, pretty far principled pluralism and so forth versus yeah. everybody's views of the same. Well, you know, Ron, Ron explained to me uh, a, a few years back, we we're kind of talking about this, that uh, they fundamentally, their goal is the same, but it's kind of like talking about uh, tissues. You have brand name, uh, Hitler or Marx or uh, Mao Zedong, uh, yeah, Mao Zedong, uh, uh, Ver, you know, kind of like talking about Kleenex mm -hmm. versus Scots or something like that. But they're all trying to get to the same place ultimately, which is total government control. That's uh, that's tragic. Um, no. I don't uh, know if so. you see, uh, we talk a lot, and I'm sure you do as well in apologetics ministry, about how to witness to people who are in cults, you know, Jehovah Witnesses, uh, Mormons or Latter-day Saints. And, and others, Scientology, or whatever it might be, uh, some 
emergent church that's uh, dumbing down um, uh, the substitutionary atonement. Uh, you, you've got to be able to define your terms. And I think one of the things that's been valuable for me about reading this book by Josh and Sean, and actually this chart, is um, I never realized how much some of these more sociological terms like tolerance, respect, dignity, acceptance, moral judgments, personal preference. Uh, I think I know what all those terms mean. But the, uh, the shocker to me is, surprise, surprise, it's not just boomers, it's not just busters, it's not just millennials and uh, Gen Zs. A lot of people have a different understanding of these terms. And depending on what they mean, when you say, I accept you, I'd say to my gay friend who's a Green Bay Packer fan, and to him, I'm not really accepting him because the definition for acceptance uh, is different. Uh, in this particular book, on that particular one, it says it's embracing people regardless of their beliefs and lifestyle choices. But the modern view of it is uh, you not only endorse but actually praise others for their beliefs and lifestyle choices. Well, that's, right. that's a little bit We're going we're gonna to look at, look at your chart in a, in a moment, but... Uh, as we're talking about definitions, if we don't really have uh, an agreed definition, we are incapable of communicating. Right, we That's, talk past each other. Yeah, you talk past each other. It's it's sort of like watching uh, someone who speaks Russian trying to communicate with someone who speaks, uh, I don't know, Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, the frustration levels increase and they get louder as though somehow speaking louder makes them more understandable. Uh, it's, it's a similar kind of a thing. I mean, in, in a few years back, when we said, you know, uh, I, I will tolerate you, it was already known between the parties in this exchange that toleration meant, I don't agree with you, I think you're wrong, but I'm not going to beat you up, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, it was like, all, it was already that was the definition. We we already know we disagree, but we're going to act kindly toward one another in spite of our disagreements. I disagree with what you say, but I defend to the death your right to say it. Who st who exactly. said that? Somebody. I don't know. I don't know, but that's classic liberalism. Be careful not to steer into that one, Donna. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> classic liberalism is a good thing. You know, we want to be well read. We want to read both sides. Uh, but that doesn't mean we agree with both sides. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's like when we talk about laws. I, I do not believe uh, same gender uh, relationships should be considered a marriage. Me. Uh, but I would argue that they have every right as citizens, since we don't live in a theocracy, to try to persuade legislators to legislate toward their viewpoint. Sure, I think they have that right as citizens. But I also believe they should fight for my right to tr uh, attempt to persuade legislators to legislate in my direction, which would be opposed to them. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we're going to look at your chart uh, at your charts in a moment, and le and let's go through definitions of why they're important. Because um, tolerating intolerance, what does that mean? In its first place is definition. What was it? What is it today? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I have someone very close to me who at one time said, I can tolerate anything except intolerance. And I went, wait a minute. What they just said is, I can tolerate anyone who agrees with me. I cannot tolerate anyone who disagrees with me. Uh, right. That's fundamentally what that means. But we are going to hear from one of our sponsors. Yes, and I, I hope it's uh, apropos. We have a couple of questions here. Have those boring family dinners become unbearably tedious? Do you wonder when someone will invent a board game that gives your life a real purpose? Do you want to be part of something bigger than yourself while remaining the center of your universe? Well, we have just the thing you're looking for. The new board game from the Real McCoy Game Company. Gaming Company, where's the outrage? It comes with its own game board, but no unfair inequality promoting dice. The rules for taking turns instead are each player gets points for being in an oppressed group. And then turns are taken in the order of the most points. Next, 
you choose a bankroller known as the game's George Soros. The George Soros distributes the game cards, and these game cards have everything you need to bring meaning and purpose into your life. Then each player chooses a game piece and plays it, places it in the forward space. Since there are no uh, dice, and we're basing this on, on points gained from having a victim status, this particular player is named Brielneld, and she is an African-American, Native American, non-binary, transgender, former female who prefers the pronoun G. And since there are no dice, uh, G will simply go to the next space. And where is it that she chose to land on? A Christian-owned bakery. She picks her card and gets free lawyers. She occupies the space, and she then moves to the just visiting space where she completely bypasses the free speech zone because she's taken and she has taken an entitlements card. So she can just blow off those fascist white supremacists and their stupid free speech. Yes. Where's the outrage from the real McCoy gaming company will bring meaning and purpose while letting you remain the center of your universe. So I like it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> You're not going to play that game? Yeah. yeah. Intersectionality, the whole, you get extra points based on your yes. status. That's, that's quite creative. But I've never heard Mount Carmel Outreach, excuse me, Midwest what? Christian Outreach International, <laughs> MCOI, referred Inco to as McCoy before. The real McCoy. The real McCoy, that's it. Well, yeah, we're, we're going to get a Twitter handle by that name. Uh, <laughs> Will you be Hatfield then, Ron? Uh, the real Hatfield, yeah. Hatfield and, uh, and it could be McCoy. <laughs> didn't, didn't think of that. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> So, okay. Ron, you want to bring up the chart? Let's kind of go through this so we can have something uh, substantive by the time we're done today. Okay, so I have this chart. I have, uh, I have not been uh, introduced to it other than to, okay, let's minimize, minimize, well, minimize. Well, Joe, Joe's going to be a resident smart guy today because he's reading the book. So, <laughs> okay. so hold on. i got to get back to the top of it here. I Apparently, I'm, I'm on the wrong slide. The chart's so. almost boom, worth the boom, price boom, of the book. Boom. So here's the whole chart, and uh, I'm going to, um, well, as you can see at the top, there's word, biblical understanding, and contemporary cultural understanding. So I'm going to I'm gonna zoom in on the first two rows and let you talk about them, okay? Okay. I already I already read the one for uh, tolerance. Maybe we go down to respect. Can we do that? Oh, so that's what you're reading. For, I, I guess I yeah. wasn't, just to refresh my memory. Okay. So, I read so fresh. Okay. Biblical understanding. Which is uh, also traditional. Yeah, simply respect and recognize and respect, right. know, if, even if you don't agree. But, Especially if you don't. That's that's why yeah. you don't have to be tolerant. But uh, the contemporary cultural understanding is do those things even if, uh, and not only do those things, respect and recognize, but acknowledge them as to equally be equally valid. valid. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay. Uh, respect, traditional uh, definition, also more of a biblical one, is giving due consideration to others as a valuable human being or human beings without necessarily endorsing their beliefs and lifestyle choices, uh, mm -hmm. whereas the more contemporary cultural understanding of the word respect, so when you say you respect somebody, you got to be careful about this. Uh, that one says you wholeheartedly approve of others' beliefs or lifestyle choices as equally valid. So if you're a Christian and you say, well, according to my uh, faith, my belief system, homosexuality is a sin. Uh, and to practice homosexuality is, in fact, a grave sin. You would be already on strike two here. You would be called intolerant and disrespectful. Yes. Yes. Okay. Personally, I think I would, I would, uh, I mean, I recognize your distinction between the two. Uh, there are people who believe that they have same sex attraction who are celibate. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure if they are seeking to live for Christ and what he has for them that I would say necessarily that they're struggling with that attraction is the same because, you know, we all attempted, what is it? Luther says, uh, it's not the birds that fly overhead that uh, is a 
giving us the problem. It's when they land in our hair and make a nest. Uh, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> but anyway, well, yeah. If, if you if you have someone who is same sex attracted but is celibate, and they're struggling with that issue, that uh, would that be any different than say someone who is uh, uh, a male, a biological male, who is married but also attracted to women, not his wife but refraining from acting on that. Is there a difference in there? It strikes me as pretty similar. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 on the one hand, it is similar because it is, uh, it's counter creational. Though, you're, it? you're not supposed to, well, you, you know, God made the two sexes to attract to each other. Yep. So on the one hand, that in itself is good. But if you are attracted in a sexual way, you know, it's I, I, I do think there is a level that we really haven't explored as no. Christians, lar largely because we. Um, because of this divide right here. Well, <laughs> People started well because, because, you know, it's it is a fraught subject. We are we have so many people every year who, who fall into adultery. So we have this. Um, question is it which comes from the movie um when harry met sally is it possible for may, uh, men and women to be just friends and of course harry's answer was no you, you know there will always be sex involved at some level um now there's a book out by amy bird it just it's uh, been out for a few weeks it's called why can't we be friends in which he tries to explore the whole question of well, wait, wait a minute, are, why would why are we going to accept what this secular Hollywood movie is saying? Maybe that's not a biblical answer. And I haven't I haven't read the book, so I can't you know speak to it. But um, I remember a long time ago there was a book. Um, uh, what was his name? John Powell. Remember that guy? I do. Yeah, he was a Jesuit priest who wrote books that a lot of Christians liked. Pro life and, stuff, I think. And he was writing from the perspective of a guy who was celibate. And he said, you know, there's just something about, there's just something different, me as a celibate priest relating to men as opposed to women. They bring something different to the relationship. Henry Nowen is similar in that regard. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, well, let, let's take a look at the next one just uh, for fun. Okay. Um, uh, acceptance, you know, you say. Dignity. Dignity is uh, it. Uh, dignity? Thanks. I've got the yeah. top there. My stigmatism. Ah, I can see it now. Right. <laughs> uh, the traditional or more biblical views that were created in the image of God. I mean, even Jewish people know this. This is in the Old Testament scriptures back in Genesis 1 and 9. And created in the image of God, humans have an inherent and inalienable uh, worth of mm -hmm. infinite value. Um, Whereas the more popular view of dignity is that humans have an inherent worth shaped and realized by personal choices stand, and standards created by the individual. I think I would also add, or by their oppressed group, depending on how many points they get to play your game there made you by the real McCoy. But yeah, it's, it's somehow uh, shaped, perspective-laden, and um, either self-made as in a more radical post-modernity or um, uh, tribal uh, interest victim type groups that bestow upon us our value and dignity versus that it comes from uh, creation and uh, from our, via our constitution, certain inalienable rights. So, it's, so, the, that's so the, the Christian view anchors our worth and value in our relationship to God. Right, and we're in His image. Uh, whereas the secular the, the, and the contemporary cultural one is anchoring it in your personal choice, your right. personal choices. You, you, which is very existentialist, you know. Yes, it is. And even if you don't have a relationship with God through Christ, uh, the Christian still believes you've been created by God. You're in His image, a broken image, fallen image, but still present. Uh, James at three says. Uh, we bless God with our tongue and curse people made in his image. These things ought not to be. So there's there's something of the image of God while Mar is still present. Um, acceptance, uh, the more biblical or uh, traditional, go to Webster and look it up, embracing people regardless of their beliefs and lifestyle choices. Accept them as human beings, as a family member, as a 
uh, member of society. Uh, but uh, the, the popular view now, the definition of this, if you talk to somebody and say, I accept you, they're hearing that, especially if they're uh, a large percentage of millennials and definitely Generation Z. They're hearing that as acceptance is not only endorsing them, but actually praising them for their beliefs and their lifestyle choices. Now, let me ask you a question. Does this go both ways, though, or does it only go in one direction? In other well, words, that's where it's self contradictory. Because what do you mean? they would not oh. celebrate and praise you for having biblical convictions or having standards or having boundaries that are different than theirs. And so each one of these definitions on the left hand column really are self contradictory if you look at them closely. But it doesn't matter because of what we said earlier in the program. People aren't thinking. They're feeling, right? So there was a, a group, I'm thinking right now, there, there's a, a group of students who um, were, sh were, were shown a, a video of, you know, a Christian pastor talking about speaking from the scriptures and holding to the position that, you know, um, you know the, the husband is the head of the home and, and men are to be the head of the church. And uh, the students roundly condemned this pastor. And then uh, they showed a video of a Muslim man talking about the proper times when you can beat your wife and how often you can do it and, and, and how, what kind of bruises you're allowed to leave. And the students refused to criticize or condemn him. No, that's his culture. That's because and, they've been playing your game, which is a little right. bit too real. <laughs> They've got and, points and, through. and so my position on this is the one thing that holds the, the one thing that basically guides all of their thinking uh, is that it, it's against God's word. They are consciously rebelling against Christian truth. This is the kind of sin that you probably can't commit if you were ever in a culture that never heard of the Bible. That's you know what I'm saying? Yeah, think think a, about that. If there was a culture that never heard of the Bible, you would have, based on all we know about anthropology, every culture has its own moral standards. Right. And they try to apply them consistently across the board. And so if somebody comes in from another culture and in their culture, um, you know, they don't beat their wives, but this, this new alien culture they're introduced to does. Let's say they're even a matriarchal society. There are a few of them out there, you know, in some place, in some corners of the world. Um, and, and yet somebody comes in and says, oh, by the way, we beat our wives, you know, they would be offended and they would never ask, oh, well, wait a minute, are, are you Muslim? Oh, well, in that case, it's all right. You know, that would never occur to them. So in, in this case, it is simply as long as you're against Christianity, in your court. Oh, Muslims, you're not you're you're not Christians. I think that's really why in, in addition to the shibboleth that you shouldn't criticize other people's cultures unless they're western Christians. Unless it's western civ, right? Yeah, then you know, I I do believe it's it's a it's it's a, a conscious rebellion against scripture as in Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage? Why do the people imagine a vain thing? What, they say, let us cast his chains off of us. That's yeah. what they're saying. You know, Ron, I think um, what you're saying is really true. I, it reminds me of Abdu Murray. He's with uh, Ravi Zacharias Ministry and his book, Post-Truth. And this term that gets bantered around about being in a post Christian nation. I'm not sure some of these definitions would really fly in any culture or a civilization that hasn't been influenced by Christianity. Uh, on the other hand, I suspect there could be the naive uh, freshman that is experimenting sexually and his parents kicked him out of the house and now he's found a, a college support group made up of uh, uh, upperclassmen or grad student psychology majors that are surrounding him or her with all kinds of support and their own anecdotal stories of their woundedness and they're empathizing and they're taking them out to lunch and they're, they're really loving on them. I'm not sure they're necessarily thinking, uh, uh, this is because of my Christian worldview that I'm, uh, I'm thinking in these ways emotionally. There's a lot of, uh, 
uh, sociological schmoozing that goes on in these areas and group think that just seem to bypass everything. So I think a person that grew up in a, even an unchurched family may have that. But I, I totally agree. With it. I don't think yeah. the definitions stand up. <laughs> you, know, well, I, I, you know, I have said, and I, I don't know, Joe, if you've heard me say this before, Ron certainly has, uh, and I talk about this a lot. I think most of us, get our belief system by osmosis. We just sort of breathe it in uh, by the books we read, the literature we read, the movies we watch, the people we hang around with. We don't really think through what the ramifications of any particular idea are. We just adopt it because of what's going on around us. We swim in this in this well yeah it helps the world it helps make sense of the world and everybody else seems to go along with it, you know. Uh, there's something about just, you know, we don't have time to think through every issue. And so if we have a, if we have credible people who, you know, I mean, technically we do have time, you know, we really do. I mean, to, to think through the important ones we do, but we, we're, we're so busy crowding out that time with entertainment and, you know, frivolous things and, you know, whatever that, uh, we, 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 we neglect thinking through things. And so it's it's just so much easier just to rely on the consensus, the consensus of our social group. Absolutely. Right. We You're don't right. we don't have right. to go we don't have to go through this whole chart. Uh, There's only think, two more lines left, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think Josh and Sean would love us to go out and buy their book, uh, The Beauty of. Uh, oh, but isn't this Anton. a lot easier? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Really, I mean, Cheaper. the chart is really quite good. He's got another one where he. Uh, uh, well, here, let me, uh, let, let me, I'll let you, sh why don't you just show it to us, put it up in front of the camera. Oh, put it up in front of the camera and say something. Yeah. And, and keep talking so that the hey, camera stays on you. underlining here. What's that mean? Oh, oh I mean, you're ready. Gone, gone too far. Oh. Which chapter was that chart in? Well, it just show us the cover and the authors. Okay, there we go. Oh, oh, I found the chart. Now it's, uh, bum, 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 bum. There's the cover. Can you see the authors? I've heard of him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Evans demands a verdict. And the beauty of intolerance. The yeah. beauty about intolerance is that God doesn't tolerate our sin, which is a good thing. So he can actually let us into his heaven because he judged it at the cross. <laughs> and, and, yeah. uh, but there, there's also, and the, the chart is on page uh, 21 if you get the book. And there's a couple of other helpful things in here as well, obviously. Uh, well, he does kind of this why wait thing and you relate a principle or precept to a principle to a person where morality is rooted in the character of God, not in decrees or in uh, some higher abstraction. But So uh, back a couple hundred years ago, they the, the titles of books would go on for a couple of pages, you know. Yeah. <laughs> a, a treatise on intolerance wherein the authors – uh, I, I, you know, the, and they would give an outline of the book right there in the title. Now, Jonathan Edwards had that, yeah. yeah. It's, now, it's, it's like you you design a, a terse title designed to capture attention, and yeah. one of the ways of doing that is to have some shock value built in. Yeah. So the beauty of intolerance. Yes, there's a little. Shock uh, he has a story for that. It's pretty. He said he wanted to make a T-shirt that said. Uh, I love intolerance on the front. And then on the back, it said something like, uh, I'm so glad that Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was not tolerant of racism or Mother Teresa was not tolerant of poverty. Or It was one of those things that, yeah, people would smile at you if you turned your back to them uh, because they would see the kinds of things you weren't tolerating. Uh, but uh, they would frown at you if they saw the front side because of the prevalence of this uh, politically correct or cultural adrift or post-truth post-christian how how much of, how much of the intolerance that we see coming from certain parts of the culture today is due to a, a changing or non-existent or redefinition of morality i think a lot of it a lot of it. once you get it into the relative zone where it depends on your situation or your lifeboat or your your pastor said it's okay to hook up as long as you two love. Uh, it doesn't matter about these. Once that once that go, goes, once the standard is gone, uh, there's no clear trumpet sound. I think Amos says in his minor prophet, it's it's muffled, uh, and it makes 
makes people drift or it contributes to the drift that people already want to choose because of their broken and fallen sin nature. So, I mean, we're seeing, for example, uh, Azusa uh, uh, College. Which one is that, uh, Ron? Azusa? Azusa Pacific, uh, yeah. University. Uh, California. Uh, had uh, uh, a few months back said, okay, we're going to rewrite our um, expectations of students and we will allow same gender relationships. And then uh, last week they said, oh, well, you know what? Actually, that wasn't approved by the board. <laughs> uh, and so we're, we're, we can't go in that direction. And so they, there are the protests, you know, with signs from God supposedly saying, I approve of this relationship. Uh, now, we don't find that in scripture anywhere, obviously. So where are they getting these messages from God to then pass on to the rest of us? And what, you know, should we tolerate that or should we go, no, that really isn't what God said. And here's why, you know, would that be intolerant of us to say that? And is that necessarily a bad thing? I think we're intolerating the claim, not the people. Uh, but I think uh, we are we want to be in that conversation because thank God they changed their mind. I think Ron mentioned earlier that uh, World Vision went through a similar escapade. It's hard for me uh, um, in upper level management not to think that a particular large donor said, I'd love to give you this gift and it'd sure be a lot easier to give it to you if you did something like this more politically correct. And so they did it. And then they found out that some of their other donors that added up to more dollars than the one that gave said, we're not supporting this nonsense. Get this stuff out of here. I just talked to a colleague of mine, James Panafino in New York at Syracuse. They kicked him off the college a few years ago and they wanted to sandblast a saying that was in their chapel. It said, you must worship God in spirit and truth. Well, the new chancellor says, uh, We've got to value each other and accept each other using the right definition. He says, and this is who we should be. This is who we are. They're having a prayer meeting in that chapel now at Syracuse uh, that honors this verse. Uh, so as, a, spirit and truth. as a person who worked for five and a half years, not, not in a very important position, but in the fundraising department of the flagship evangelical college in the nation, Wheaton College. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I was, I was not a, I was, you know, lower level employee there. But still. Uh, but still, I, I kind of learned a lot, you know, about, you know, the relationship between those people who have to go out and represent the college to the donors and the donors keep, you know, the, the students will, you, there will, there may never be a generation of students that fully appreciates the fact that college is not really free. And that, and that their and that their tuition, you know, if they should pay any tuition at all, it it probably even if it's an expensive tuition, it covers only a small portion of the expense right. of everything. It's not just it's not just salaries of professors. You've got buildings, you've got infrastructure, you've got staff, you've got grounds keepers, you've got all these things that the kids just take for granted. The, the library, the the internet, everything, and. Um, you know, so it's like I've run through my head the various scenarios that could have accounted for what happened at Azusa Pacific. <laughs> I'm thinking <laughs> I could and I, I could just picture if, if I was at Wheaton or if even I was at Azusa Pacific, I'm working in working in the advancement division or development department, whatever they call it over there. And, uh, you know, the somebody walks back from the the main building saying, uh Oh, they're about to announce something that we, they didn't check with us. <laughs> and <laughs> no, I tried to talk them out of it, but they already cleared it. You know, it's like, and sure enough. And I tried it, it. Maybe they, maybe they didn't even get that much warning. You know, maybe, maybe they found you know, out I'm about gonna, everybody else I, did. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to throw out a, a different question here. Uh, as I'm trying to get to, I, I guess I'm trying to get to, a place to say, well, here's where we think this is coming from. I mean, aside from our sinful nature, I mean, that is really the answer. But how much of this can be attributed to the prevalence of psychology with its idea that we are all victims? Yeah, I think well, that's the big one, that we're all basically good. That, that's well, erroneous. That, that, you know, um, 
I don't see, I mean, I know some psych psychologists and they don't buy into that, you know, and these right. are pra practicing psychologists. Sure. I think, I think there's a lot more diversity in the psychological community. And I don't, I, I, the, uh, during the late eighties and early nineties, we had that satanic ritual abuse thing going on. We had, right. Right. we had, um, uh, we had lots of so-called family therapists separating children from their parents. One of the most high profile cases was, uh, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, you know, had this kind of Svengali-like relationship with his psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever. Didn't talk to his brothers or his family for years. Um, so the Beach Boys toured without him. Uh, you know, we, you know, it was, uh, you had a, a spate of all of these uh, books uh, that promoted these ideas of the, what you're talking about, Don, victim status, uh, Bradshaw on the family gets on public television and declares that uh, John Bradshaw uh, declares that um, what the typical American went through in his or her childhood, accumulate, you take that experience accumulated over the course of their childhood, early adulthood, and so on, is the same as what a Holocaust victim experiences. <laughs> And so uh, the book came out. I forget the author's name. I, 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 it's over there somewhere on my shelf. Um, I'm dysfunctional. You're dysfunctional. Sure. Uh, she's she's a Jewish uh, feminist sociologist, and she reacted strongly against all this stuff. And one of the one of the uh, perspectives that she brings to the table is is her father went through the Holocaust. You know, and and she had a kind of a that gave her kind of an interesting perspective on people who were saying these kinds of things. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we went through this craze, but it was a it was a fad, uh, and it was I think it was informed by what I think Vadi Baucom has put his finger on, and that is the uh, cultural Marxism, yeah. which uh, it's it would take a while to explain it, but uh, when he talks about Antonio Gramsci who was killed during World War II when he talks about how those ideas were taken up into Marxism and it's really created kind of an aberrant form of Marxism that isn't accepted by traditional Marxists, but it, it, cultural Marxism, but it, it comes through into the, through Great Britain in the sixties into the seventies and eighties. You have um, that guy who wrote, uh, uh, he's uh, uh, Cornell West. Cornell West was one of the big, uh, influences and in bring this into the uh, American, uh, you know, academic psyche in the late eighties. Intersectionality. Your yeah, book. Well, your your game. That's, my game. That's yeah. Well, the, the Cornell West mainly introduced the idea that there's something beyond just simply class warfare going on, and that is all these different minorities oppressing, being oppressed by the majority, and so on. Like so that that feeds into the whole victim narrative uh marxist already had a victim narrative and that is you know the the the, the history of the history of the world is the history of class struggle you know it's right. always the haves versus the have-nots well now they're introducing it's it's the whites versus everybody who is uh white males patriarchy. versus the rest of the world yeah the patriarch the white patriarchy and uh, it, was, it developed over about 20 years, you know, get, it, refining its views and um, just in time for <laughs> just in time for the 21st century, you know. No, I think. And, oh, go ahead. Uh, and and, and Vadi Balkan puts his finger on it, I think, when he taught. He was way ahead of the curve for a lot of people. I um, like to respond to what you said, Don, um, about causation and psychology. And this is this is just anecdotal. I don't have the Francis Schaeffer overview of history so much, but I think a lot of the people who are in administrative roles in large Christian organizations aren't necessarily people that majored in Bible, apologetics, theology, and philosophy, and they did get a good dose of liberal arts. Frankly, I'm kind of glad they did in terms of interpersonal skills, but at the same time, when a, a big donor comes with money or whatever like that, I don't think they're always thinking worldviewishly 
or with discernment <laughs> on these matters. And you know, the biggest drift is against uh, the authority of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture. Once people start getting into moral relativism, or here's our here we boil it all down to these three points that are part of our statement of faith or our our purpose statement and stuff like that. You can get pretty squishy with that stuff if you're not immersed in the truth of Scripture. My wife read a book uh, when she was in education called The Bully, The Bullied, and The Bystander. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of power issues in this whole Marxist struggle stuff, and also in campus, and also on boards. And by the way, the people at Azusa Pacific that disagreed with the policy changed back to normalcy. They could probably transfer to Calvin College. But that's another subject. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, well, you, you, but, you know, there is a fourth category. You don't have to be uh, the bully or the bullied or the bystander. You can well, be a builder like Nehemiah. And this is building, building a wall to come out there and bicker with you and get assassinated. You, you used a key <laughs> word. In, the, the key word in the ideology is power. <clears throat> yeah, it is. And the assumption that power determines everything. The yeah, power determines true. And, and the power is inherently power. and power is inherently evil. Yeah. But they well, want and, and <laughs> one, one of the problems in, in our in our in our society today, they, they talk about being tolerant, and yet they feel unsafe when they actually have to hear competing views. Yeah. Uh, and, and and then are in search for a, a safe space. Uh yeah, and to get, we, get away from have, that power. Yeah, yeah. and, and we, we have we have a sponsor that kind of addresses that as well. Oh, good. Yeah. They're they're being brought to us by World's End Theology Outlet, your one stop resource for half baked heresies, dubious doctrines, and other ideas whose time has gone. And they want to know that they, if you're a, a college student who's going home for the holidays, that they can really relate and empathize with the things that you are dealing with right now. So after four semesters at your small progressive liberal arts college, you're flying home to visit your red state relatives. You remember to bring your emotional support puppies. You packed all your comfort blankets and pillows. You even remembered your adult coloring books, but it still feels like something is missing. You don't feel safe. What can you do? Well, you need instant safe space. With instant safe space, you get guaranteed protection from trigger words, microaggressions, cognitive dissonance, and unwelcome thoughts. You, you can feel protected, feel safe. You take instant safe space and you apply it to all your friends and relatives when you arrive home. Instant safe space only from World's End Theology Outlet, your one-stop resource for half-baked heresies, dubious doctrines, and other ideas. This time is gone. Because we care. Be, we, is that we a do. vitamin? What do you take? What, what do you take to get this? <laughs> <laughs> We're back to psychology. <laughs> so I, I want to I jump this just, just a moment because uh, someone came to my mind as we were talking about uh, – tolerating intolerance and what does that look like and how our culture has changed. Uh, I, I don't, frankly, I don't really know if it has changed. It just sort of, just sort of swings. It seems to me over time from one fad to another, but uh, a, a really popular guy who's not a Christian today is speaking out on this is Jordan, Jordan. Peterson from Canada. Yes, he is. Uh, why is, is that good? And if so, why? Well, I think sometimes it's good to have somebody that speaks within a relatively shared worldview, affirm some of your stuff, because if you're just speaking as a Christian on behalf of Christians for the cake maker or the photographer, it can seem pretty uh, self-interest. That's one of the reasons why I like the fact that Jews and Christians alike were speaking out on the persecution of Azidis in uh, North Iraq and other oppressed groups. So yeah. it's... I think uh, Jordan's got some stuff right. He's clearly not a Christian, but uh, he has some shared worldview convictions. Uh, yeah, I would say he's brilliant. I mean, and he's extremely well read, and he used to be a socialist. So he has the mm -hmm. same narrative that I run into occasionally. Uh, people I know personally and people uh, who are well known and I've never met. Uh, and you know, he, you know, you, you listen, I've listened to a lot of his lectures and it's the, the breadth of his reading is just amazing, yeah. you know? Uh, and I mean, he can quote Nietzsche from heart by heart and he 
he he really digs deeply into um, into these authors, and and I, for that reason alone, I would recommend any person to listen to him. And of course, as you're a Christian, uh, if you're a Christian, you, you know you listen with discernment. You know you you uh, you look for th- you 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 try to be ready to filter out unbiblical ideas. You know, compare everything everybody says to Scripture. What what re- what's really astounding is uh, the depth of his analysis. Uh, gi- given just how how he how he uh, so thoroughly works with ideas, um, even if I radically disagreed with him, I would learn something from him. Right. There's some but, other people like that in the limelight. Yeah. Area. I think. Even, uh, yeah, there are some people who who just they know so much more than I do about particular topics that I would listen to them even if they were even if I radically disagreed with them on let's say politics or religion or or whatever I I could still learn from them but there's a but the reaction against Jordan Peterson is so typical of the generation where they, they don't they, they just write him off complete he's a total idiot he's a total moron he has nothing to say that's worth listening to and he's and, one of the nicest guys in the world I mean Ben Shapiro can get in your face millennials love him uh, yeah. Dennis Prager maybe a little too old, Mark Levin too legal, but when it comes to Jordan, you got a really really nice guy. He can be on a well, talk show surrounded by people who disagree, and he ben, just asks questions. Ben Shapiro, <laughs> I, I've never seen Ben Shapiro get ruffled. I've never seen him lose his temper. No, me either. He's one of these guys yeah. like like uh, Jordan. He's just very. He just says things. He's just very straight. He just yeah. He's very pointed. He, and people maybe don't like that style, but you know what? You know, it's, it's better than screaming at the top of your lungs. And and, well, uh, and it, is, it yeah. may not be that they don't like the style, because as as, uh, as Joe pointed out, um, uh, Jordan Peterson is just relaxed, calm, never doesn't seem to have a, a, a an angry word well, cross his lips, at least that we've seen. <laughs> and yet, they they the tolerant group hates him well, uh, well jordan peterson has an advantage in that he has been dealing with undergraduates for the last 30 years <laughs> and you know it's like he, he, there's nothing you can throw at him probably that hasn't already been thrown you know so right well that that's pretty true he probably has heard, heard it all before so but you know there there's a there's a perfect case of what we're talking about someone that that the three of us would be in a room with him over lunch with him. There's a myriad of things with which we would disagree with him on. And it would be a, an engaging discussion, count uh, point, counterpoint. Uh, and, and we might all walk away the richer for, a, That's for right. the time. You know, yeah. he, I mean, Jordan Peterson, he hasn't only read, Orwell's Animal Farm in 1984. He's read like everything Orwell wrote, you know. And so it's like I, I think I downloaded a book uh, that Orwell wrote based on his recommendation uh, it, that I didn't even know existed. I didn't even know Orwell wrote it. And so he's that's how that's uh, there. You, there's so much to learn from this man, even if you don't agree with him. This post-truth culture, post-Christian, yes. is suffocating. There's no yes. freedom. There's no thought. There's no education. There's no real education. There is indoctrination. Yes, I, I, in the hard sciences, in the STEM subjects, yes, there's education going on. They, but, they, think, they're, they think they're pleasuring themselves. But, I have but to use when, the word that you said earlier. It's auto-erotica asphyxiation. Well, yeah, yeah, or, or, or audio, <laughs> audio erotica. Kind of, kind of reminds me of a line uttered by George Costanza on a Seinfeld episode. But anyways, uh, the uh, <laughs> but All right, we, we are we are running over here, so I'm going to ask. Okay. We're going to run over a couple of minutes. I'm going to just kind of pose this out here and say, we're not going to. We know we're not going to be able to fix society and culture. We we know that. So how is it that you and I and Ron and and those who are tuning in can um, figure out ways to communicate or attempt to communicate with those who claim to be tolerant but in fact are not. What is it that we can do? Ask more questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, define terms. It, get, that, that Smile. Sounds, what you just said, ask more questions, <clears throat> that is 
the missing ingredient in so much of what passes for education nowadays. Yes. A mm. proper education begins with teaching students how to ask the right questions. Research. Indoctrination begins with giving people the quote right answers. Answer, right. And That's indoctrination. <laughs> What's that? And how they'll get funding. If they right, how they'll get funding. certain answers, they'll get funding. If they don't, now, now, now there are some subjects. There's some <laughs> subjects. Yeah, there's some subjects. I want a disclaimer here that you know, like when you're teaching math, you're going to yeah. give them the right answer. I mean, Pretty you're going to give them. Yeah. You're going to give them, you know, the structure of math. Engineering. And tell yeah. them how to solve the problems. Engineering the same way, but in the humanities, it's tough. You know, so much of it is not about the data, the information mechanically processing it, learning the steps and the algorithms. It's, that's not it. It's learning to ask the right question. Right question. And be an you exception know, to their perspective of bigotry. So if they right. you're a bigot, definitely he, buy their lunch. This is, to, to <laughs> me, this, to me, this is like pivotal to everything we've talked about here today. When I, I get calls all the time, Joe, as, as you probably know, uh, someone will call me and say, I have a Jehovah's Witness coming in one hour. What, what do I tell them? Or I'm meeting a Mormon, you know, tomorrow afternoon. Or I have an atheist in my family. What verse can I give him? Or something like that. Silver and, and very often the people on the, the person on the end of the phone is shocked when I say, you're going about this the wrong way. They go, what do you mean? I go, ask them why they are what they are. Ask them. Because anything I tell you is going to miss the mark. If someone is a Jehovah's Witness because they had no friends, Debating the Trinity with them is just not going to be helpful. They didn't become a Joseph's Witness because of theology. They became a Joseph's Witness because they have friends, maybe for the first time. Uh, if you're talking to a, a Mormon who went away to, to college as a fine, upstanding Lutheran young man, met this beautiful young lady uh, <laughs> in a group of other Mormons who are trying to live clean lives on the college scene, uh, and he fell in love with her, and he comes home and says, Mom and Dad, I'm marrying a Mormon, and I'm becoming a Mormon. The reason that he's becoming a Mormon has nothing to do with theology, but everything to do with a matter of the heart. So yep. you're not going to get him out that way. Ask the right yeah. questions. Ask that the right questions. Crucial. It's it's important, just as important in relationships as it is in understanding the the life's questions, the kind of questions that are asked or, or answered or, or sought to be answered in theology, philosophy. In, in all in all, all across the humanities. When you're studying English literature, very often English lit classes end up being discussions of philosophy, experience, theology, because those are the things the authors are dealing with. How do you read Dostoevsky without talking yeah. about God? The problem of pain, right? Uh, yeah. Jesus asked an awful lot of questions. I mean, he made a lot of declarative statements about hell and money and property and authority and but he asks an awful lot of questions. I think we would benefit from asking more, listening more. I think it comes under that gentleness and respect at the end of our champion verse, First Peter 3.15. That's good stuff, guys. All right. All right, Ron, you want to walk us out of here? Oh. Uh, yeah, let's, let's take, escort you guys to the door here with, uh, by uh, uh, giving credit where credit is due. Our resident cult leader profiler is Neil before me. Our wardrobe manager, see how it fits you. Our culinary services chef is ham and cheese. Our tinfoil hat provisioner is just in case. Our Jehovah's Witnesses coverage comes from Armageddon and D opposer. Our Mormon archives manager is Polly Gummus. Our liberal denominations bureau chief is Lucy Goosey. Our transgender issues coverage comes from Ben Hur. Our special correspondent for cults based on the Hindenburg disaster and flying turkeys is Oh, to humanity. Our fact-checking supervisor is your leg pulling. Our technical assistance comes through murky research. Our legal advisors are at the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Our grievance resolutions director is Yovana Pisami. Our director of privacy assurance is wiretapping. And our original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. The Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in cooperation with Emergency Manicure Productions, both of whom are solely responsible for all of this content you just watched and heard, but you will never, never be able to prove that in a court of law. Never, never. <laughs> that's, why we pay, we, that's why we pay Dewey Cheatham and Howe the big bucks. Okay. And with that, with that, say goodnight, Dick.
<laughs> Can I do it? God bless you. Okay, nobody watching that Mother's knows, brothers. knows what that refers to. We know to. what it's referring to. <laughs> Rumor. <laughs> yeah. Next week it's the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate the Award. Flying okay. Fickle Finger of Fate. <laughs> yeah, we, we, need, we need to have our golden whatever that was award. <laughs> the, golden, the, the Face Palm of Gold. The, the, the palm. palm of Gold Award. Yeah. we got to get back to that. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Adios. Adios.